Uh, but just want to say thanks again for coming. Monday night was more focused, this recap was more focused on the academic changes that were made. This evening is more focused on Greenville's finances. Um, when you guys were submitting your questions through the uh, survey on, on over the weekend, finances came up a lot. And so we decided to break them off into two different evenings. So um, I'm going to introduce our uh, panel here this evening, go over some ground rules, explain the format, and then we'll get going. So again, I'm Ross. To my left here is Scott Giffen, our Vice President for Advancement here at Greenville University. Next to him is Suzanne Davis, our Executive Vice President and Chief Legal Officer. And at the far left is Barb Sands, our Chief Financial Officer. Um, so this evening, like I mentioned uh, on Monday, uh, this evening will be uh, prepared questions that you guys submitted over the weekend uh, through that survey. Um, throughout the time tonight, we are gonna do an open forum at the end. So if you would like to write down follow-up questions or maybe you had a question that you didn't get submitted in time uh, over the weekend, go ahead and start writing those down. Our two kind of gatekeepers for the evening are Anna and Kinsey sitting right up here up front. So as you have questions, um, send them their way, a, you know, piece of paper or however you want to do it. Um, and then we'll take a short break. I'll have them bring those questions up to me and then I'll keep going through that, through that format as well. We'll also be taking notes for this, this night. Um, so also like Monday, gonna go over just some quick ground rules for civil discourse. Um, I was really encouraged with how, how Monday evening um, went. I hope you guys were as well. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, really encouraged with just the questions that were asked from the audience um, and how how the interactions went between you know the panel and um, and the students. So I encourage you to engage in that manner. Be respectful. Be kind. Uh, you know, easy stuff. Don't be rude. Don't be cruel. Um, think about it for a second before you ask your question um, because it, it'll go a long way. You know, moving forward. Does that make sense? I'm gonna go over the same three questions I also asked uh, on Monday evening as well, because I think that's important. So, for our panel, I have three questions for you. Will you be transparent in your communication, even if it means telling us that you can't tell us something? Will you stick with us, even if we've submitted a question that's a bit uncomfortable to answer? Will you commit to empathizing with us and remain gracious when we aren't sure how to express our confusion, frustration, and anxiety? And for you in the audience this evening, will you listen with empathy and remain open-minded even when it gets difficult? Yes. yes. Will you be kind and respectful to our leaders on this panel, being engaged and making eye contact and avoiding side conversations throughout the evening? Yes. 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 And finally, the same joke I made, will you check yourself before you wreck yourself this evening? <laughs> Okay, uh, so we're gonna get started here. Uh, our, our first question of the evening uh, for, for Scott is, can you talk to us about, um, I have seen over and over across campus memes, I've seen you know, you know, jokes and stuff about the tower, about the button, how those were financed, why those were built, um, and for many of you who don't know, advancement, the, that wing of the administration, focuses on raising raising funds for the institution. So that's Scott's main role. So Scott, can you give us, can you maybe debunk some myth? Can you give us uh, how those two and other projects were funded? Um, and other projects like that, how does that funding kind of work? Sure, so for, so for the Hope Tower, the Hope Memorial Tower, and also for the Button or the Last Supper, yeah. you know, um, those were all donor directed. Um, so specifically for the Hogue Memorial Tower, um, there's a lot of reasons uh, why we decided to do the tower, and I can go into that. Um, and they're complex, um, but I wanna to try to make it as simple as possible. But as far as just the, the money that came in, when Hogue Hall came down in 2008, um, it was a, an extremely emotional time for our community. Um, even though it was just a building, and it was not Greenville University. Too many, especially the people that are away from campus, saw that as the institution coming down. And so it was, uh, it was an emotional event, and a lot of people gave money directly towards rebuilding Hoke Hall. Um, and there was quite a bit of money that came in for that. 
Um, and uh, for years, we, we looked at possibly exploring rebuilding that <coughs> toe call. Um, at the end of the day, we decided that wasn't going to be a good use of resources uh, to try to replicate a building. Um, it would have been unbelievably expensive to do it justice as far as how it looked and to, to try to replace it, if you will. Um, and so um, we, had, we had lots of dollars that were set aside in the account for Hoke Hall. Um, there were efforts to see if we could use those funds in other ways, but because the donors were so attached to that building emotionally, um, they were restricted. And when, what, what we do as far as an advancement, I mean, the donor is, is very important. So when a donor tells us to do something, um, we either say, we don't want your money, we're not gonna do that, but if we do say, we'll take your money, we want to do what we tell, what the donor tells us to do. So those are our choices. And, and it's something we take very seriously because trust with donors is, that's what we have to offer when we're talking about philanthropy. Um, is a donor makes a donation to us and they trust us to use that money in the way that they intended it to be used. Um, and so we went back to each of those donors that gave to that uh, fund. <coughs> Um, and we explained the, the concept of we're not going to rebuild Hope, Hope Hall and spend $30 million <coughs> on a $5 million building. Um, but what we want to do is we want to create a symbol that people can remember. Um, and so we created that symbol with their monies that they gave for that. And they gave us permission to do that. Um, and so they were restricted for the purposes of Hope Hall. Um, it wasn't a situation where we could have used it for anything else. So that's the restrictions within fundraising is a very serious thing. It's a legal thing. I mean, as Barb will tell you, um, uh, we need to honor those not only for trust but also for legal reasons too. We have to be very strict with that. Um, and the same thing that happened with the Last Supper um, is is that was a, a donor project. That one of our donors wanted to do, they wanted to try to enhance the campus, they wanted to, for various reasons, maintain the spiritual emphasis on campus with having a physical something there. Um, what used to be there was the Hogue Bell was there, and so when that moved to the tower, um, it just left, a left an open spot there, and so if the donors, another donor couple came in and gave those funds to do that. And so both of those were, were donor directed um, that, that really couldn't have been used for anything else. Great, thank you. I, I'm gonna clarify this next part. I'm gonna go off script here for a second with the question. So this was not a student question that I'm gonna ask next, um, but a question that I know I've heard students ask in the past is uh, if a donor comes that wants to give money to something, um, how much is the university tied to just to, to, to going that route yeah. you know if a donor like wants to give to something maybe we don't want to invest in yeah. what is that conversation like um, and maybe have we you know turned away money in the past for things that we did not want to invest in so yeah we have recently um, we always have that option to say no to money it's a very difficult decision obviously if somebody comes to you uh, and especially when it's a large sum and they say we want to do this we try to negotiate with that donor and say, okay, well, this is what we need. And sometimes we can move a donor to reach a compromise or be like, okay, well, that's, that's you know, that, that's okay, you can do with that. But we did have a circumstance not too long ago where we had a very, very large donation, all my time, to build something very specific. And it was a huge donation, but it was only a fraction of what we needed to actually build what we needed to build. And so we actually ended up returning that money back to the donor. This was just in the last 10 years. Uh, millions of dollars. Um, uh, and it was, a, a, I think it was the right decision. Uh, extremely difficult. Um, uh, but we, what happened actually after that is after we returned the money, um, I think it showed such integrity with that that we were able to actually work with that family um, and it was actually redirected toward another purpose that actually served the institution a lot better um, and saved us from, from spending a lot of money. There are, there are donations that 
um, if you take them and you agree to do something, it actually cost you money. So you accept a million, but it takes you two million to do the project. Well, you just lost a million dollars. Um, and sometimes they're not that grand a scale. It's more like we'll give you twenty-five thousand, and you end up spending fifty. Well, sometimes you know we'll we'll try to work with that, but um, but in in this particular case, we were able to um, technically get that money back for something that actually really benefited us. But I think that that original um, having integrity with that and giving that money back was was beneficial to the relationship, and I think it made us come out better in the end. Okay, thank you. Barb, can you can you talk about um, how or how and why we've been able to hire um, employees specifically, you know, with the Smart Initiative and invest in that space? How we've been able to hire employees um, in those areas, but have had to cut faculty members. First of all, the Greenville Smart Building on the Square was a, a donor actually contacted the university and asked if. They, we would be interested in them purchasing that building to help fund initiatives, to help fund operations, and so we accepted that. That's one of those. We could have said, no, we're not interested in that, but we chose to allow this individual to buy that building for us, and then we were able to acquire a grant from the EDA that would match half of what we spent up to a uh, a million dollars yes so they would find a million if we would spend two but in in order to do that we had to raise a lot more money because we had committed to the university that we would not use operational dollars for that so no budget money is not funding the building of that project it's completely donor funded raised um, grants we received a technology grant to help fund some of that and so in the hope is, and the plan is, and it's all on course to launch those initiatives in all four floors to help fund the operations of the university that will help with budgetary concerns um, and use more innovative programs, um, more aligned with our mission, character and service, the entrepreneur side of things with the experience first and this will be a lot more hands-on learning type um, activities that will go on there as well. So completely donor offended. Does that answer your question? No. Yeah. I heard someone say something. That didn't talk about the employees. Those were donor funded initiatives to begin with. Now Elaine's position is partially funded by the Chamber of Commerce too. She's only part-time here. She's an she has the other part-time role um, with the chamber. So she's reaching out to communities um, or to different organizations within the community to help draw the community and the university together and help fund some of those projects. So, I mean, she's been really engaged with the city and in one of those initiatives. And so they are going to be doing part of the, um, I call it the patio. I'm not sure what it is. It's not done yet because of lovely weather um, that we've had and so they're paying for all of that and, and the elevator in there I mean some of those things Elaine has really worked to get other donations for that and to work with some of those other initiatives um, again to help put money back into the operating budget Barb can you can you clarify first who Elaine is because I think mm -hmm. I know who yep. she is but me neither yes. probably don't Elaine McNamara is um, one of our employees, but she's also employed by the Chamber of Commerce, as I said, but she does a lot of our community relations, bringing the community uh, of Greenville and surrounding areas with different businesses and getting those business relationships established. So I know we have one with uh, Milk House, Marku Creamery, some of those different um, initiatives. And, and again, just drawing cards to get the community together and to where we can come and use our um, skills across the uh, across Bond County, actually, and even beyond those reaches, but not just for um, the university, but again for the community as a whole, and use those collaborative efforts 
to help drive some of those relationships to where we're doing things together and help walk alongside our students. So business, you might have to do an internship somewhere and Elaine could possibly help partner you with someone within the local area so you wouldn't have to drive. It would be right here and you know then to help establish those those relationships early on and then that ultimately helps you as students enhance your careers when you are graduate from here. And Barb, second clarification. So I heard you say both the like actual building itself, but the people right now who are, you know, hired at Greenville to run that space are all donor funded. None of that has been operational funds up to this point. One, one with the one is operational now part of Elaine's salary. Part of Elaine's salary. Okay. And the other half of her salary is funded, funded by, by the, the city. Okay. Uh, Scott, this question came up a lot in the in the survey, um, and I think it really speaks to maybe I'm speaking on behalf of the students. A lot of the anxiety that I that I've heard is, will GU be open in five years? Absolutely. Um, I think um, you've got a, a great leadership team that's working for you, um, that's working for the institution to make sure that we're not only open but that we're thriving. Um, we're making decisions now to better position ourselves in the future. Um, so I, I absolutely. Um, personally, you know, I, I have two sons. I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. Um, they are allowed to go wherever they want to go. <laughs> but I would love for them to come here. I, I, I went to school here. My wife went to school here. Um, I know how powerful a place this is how life-changing it is. I didn't realize that fully probably until I was away from this place for a while and maybe experienced other educational institutions. Uh, but I, I personally, and I know that a lot of, a lot of the leadership and those that are in charge um, are, are personally invested to make sure that this place stays around and does well, does well. Great, thank you. Uh, Suzanne, I know this question came up on, on Monday a little bit. Um, is GU hoping to have more students? Um, and I know a concern that was raised Monday evening was by having less programs, does that mean we're having less opportunity to get more students? And can you speak to that? Yeah, so of course we uh, would like to have um, more students. However, we don't want to uh, have huge class sizes either. So, I mean, there's more students, but the right amount of students for, for the number of programs that we have, so the classes aren't huge. I, I before coming back to Greenville, I was an alum as well as Scott, um, I was at a state school, Eastern Illinois University, and uh, you know, very large seminar classes and, and very uh, much felt a little bit more like a number. I also was at U University of Illinois, kind of even bigger than that and so um, we do want more students so that we can right size um, the budget a little bit more and be able to pour even more resources into those programs so whenever you say would fewer programs result in fewer students I think no the initiative is to have high quality programs that students are very interested in and so we've been able to uh, launch, for example, engineering recently, agribusiness, and 10% of our incoming students were actually interested in the, these new majors. And so we wanna make sure that the majors that we offer are the ones that are very relevant to the students um, coming in and that they're having a great experience in those programs. So I don't think that less programs means less students. It means that we're really trying to focus on, on what students want and make sure they have a really quality experience when they're here. Thank you. I, I shouldn't have said this when we started. So in Suzanne's role as executive vice president, she oversees our <coughs> enrollment process and, and the enrollment you know, procedures that Greenville's go through. So put you on the spot a little bit. Can, you said you don't want too big of classes, like maybe if you put some numbers to what is an ideal class size for you know our current institution maybe we'll if you get off the top of your head like what are some of the numbers we've seen over the last couple of years and what was this incoming class this fall yeah so um 
in terms of the ideal class size, we try to have a 20 to 1 ratio um, on average. So that doesn't mean that you'll have all 20 to 1 faculty member classes. Some of the time, your uh, underclassmen kind of, uh, will have more of the larger sections, depending on the major that you're in. And then sometimes when you get to your upper division classes, they may be much lower than 20. So you're not always going to hit 20 to 1. But on average, we try to hit that, um, that size. Um, and that's that's where we are, are shooting for in the new students coming in. So there were 303 uh, new students uh, coming in as either freshmen or transfer this year, which is a good uh, class size or, or cohort size yep. coming in. Uh, so we did um, we did in, uh, increase that um, from the previous year. It was a little bit less than 300. Okay. Thank you. Barb, to, to kind of follow up on the question I asked Scott a few minutes ago, can you talk maybe in more specifics about the state of GU's financial security and, and maybe give us, you know, two or three kind of metrics that you look at that tell you whether we're doing well as an institution or not in our finances? The last few years we've actually been operating at a deficit. So our expenses have exceeded our income. And so we, have, we had to make some hard, very difficult decisions and kind of look through the budget, what percentages should be spent on this, what percentage should be spent on this. And I'm gonna talk about what those thises are. I don't think that's a word, but <laughs> it is tonight. Um, and so, as Scott already said, we have to better position ourselves today. We have to look at everything within our budget cycle and not just, is it just a revenue problem? Is it just an expense problem? We have been cutting expenses for several years as well, and we're, we're kind of getting down to bare bones. And so what does that look like? How do, again, how do we increase revenue? And so, again, making some very difficult decisions today. So, um, we don't, we, and we don't take that lightly. I mean, it's, it's been a, a journey and one that has been um, bathed and covered in prayer for many, many months. And so, um, we do understand your <coughs> hurt and your concerns tonight, too, and ongoing. Um, so, the board challenged us and said, you know, we have to start looking at this more strategically and trying to figure this out, right size the ship, as we've said. And so we've adopted a strategy now, and part of that was realigning the institution and looking at those academic programs and what do we need to cut and what do our tuition dollars look like. So I took our financial reports that from the fiscal year that we just ended. So May 31st was our, the end of our fiscal year. We don't go from January to December. We go from June 1st to May 31st, which is considered our academic year, but it's also our fiscal financial fiscal year. And so the total tuition revenue was just a little over $25 million. So that's how much our students brought in in revenue, and that's traditional grad programs, all revenue. We gave you $11.7 million in scholarships. So that is 46% of your tuition dollars went back to you in scholarships. When you look at higher ed and business sense for salary perspectives, for educational institutions, your salaries and benefits should be no more than 70 to 80 percent of your net tuition revenue. Your net tuition revenue is your total revenue dollars less your scholarships. And that remaining balance, which is 13.8 million, 70 to 80 percent of that should be your salary and benefits. Ours is over 100 percent which is astronomically high. So just salaries alone are 96% of that. 
So we had to make some uh, decisions according to that, and so we began looking at programs. And what are students asking for today? What are the demands? What do we have to offer? What can we offer? What have we started recently that the programs are growing? And so we, th that became kind of our baseline for looking at all of that. Um, some of our other percentages, whoops, I'm hitting buttons here. We have instruction and academic support, student services, so that entails student, uh, student success. Um, some of those academic programs <coughs> like tutoring, um, those we offer, I mean, that's 33%. That would include athletics and then your room and board and some of those expenses are around 20%. So there's, again, if, if you just listen to the breakdown of those, I mean, for me, it just kind of, of course, I'm a finance person, so it just kind of, you know, makes the hair out in the back of my neck stand up. Uh, but, uh, but again, those are the, some of the things that we looked at and just started looking at, okay, what are those percentages that we're spending and what is realistic and what, what should we be spending and then where do we go from there. So again, how do we put better position ourselves in each one of those areas? And so that's been our focus, that's gonna be our drive and, that, and, and continue to provide the service to you because you're still here getting that education and, and we ultimately want to serve you in those programs as well. So just look at real quick, does anybody want like a, hear that again, did the numbers part, everybody like track that well? What was the date for the fiscal years? June 1st <coughs> to May 31st. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, right. yeah, great, okay. Uh, where am I at? Yeah, Suzanne, uh, I know once again, the question that had, was, was brought up a lot and we sort of addressed on Monday, um, but were there reductions, oh, there are other reductions made before the reductions that were made last week with uh, faculty members? Yeah, so um, even though personnel is a large part of the, the budget and so it, a lot of times when you're making those changes, personnel are involved. Um, there are plenty of other non-personnel uh, type items throughout the, the year that we were looking at. One of the things that um, I really look to reduce in the areas that I oversee are external contracts that we could use uh, our own people in-house to do cheaper. So we had quite a few uh, larger contracts um, as it related um, to different things in admissions and and marketing um, and some technology services, things that were, were pretty big spends that we could pull in house. I mean, there's always some pros and cons to doing that. So sometimes you want to go and, and outsource something that you're not able to do as well in house with your own people. But we were trying to make those adaptations of what can we do really well um, with the people that we have uh, that it's cheaper than to do in-house and then what maybe do we not have the current skill sets to do and, and move that um, outsource and so there were a lot of those adjustments made that um, weren't necessarily uh, affecting people other than um, the contract services and how we got those things done so that was one thing that we've been talking about um, we, Can you give maybe one example of that, of a contract that you... Yeah, so um, we used, for example, for quite a long time, and, and an alum of ours that I really appreciate, Michael Ritter, he teaches in the, in the online business program, um, and, and there's plenty of others that were great, a great connection, a great company called Ruffalo No Lovett, and uh, essentially what they do is your communication flow, or one of the bigger things that they do is they help you figure out what students might be interested in Greenville University when you take your ACT uh, exam. A, a lot of times students will list certain types of universities or there will be ways of finding out who might be interested in uh, Greenville University and a Christian liberal arts. Also then, once you uh, get a student to click or follow a lead, they'll follow up with communication for you. So they run a call center. Uh, to, to see if those are viable students to come to your institution. And, uh, and it's a great service, it really is, um, but it's got a pretty hefty price tag on it. And so 
we looked at everything they were doing and our marketing department, our admissions department thought that we could bring a lot of that in-house and they've done a really great job of, of doing that and making that transition. And I think that was really good for us because <coughs> then the people making the calls to the prospective students are our people. Um, it, it's been much more relationship based. Uh, that's one of the reasons for the transitions um, to really get out in the community like with Elaine McNamara and others because they become more organic leads that, that tend to fit. Like they're really looking for Greenville University, not just a little bit more of a stretch over a region based on all these characteristics that um, and an analytics that Ruffalo and Levis does. So that's one example of a contract that we just completely canceled and brought in-house. And, and there was over uh, 400000 almost $500,000 worth of savings in that. Mm. By canceling those contracts? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what about contracts that you've brought in recently? For example, like Dynamic Campus. Is that saving us money or is that costing us more money? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a both and. We needed to make a significant investment in technology. Um, like, as you know, there needs to be uh, an investment in even the hardware that we uh, use for Wi Fi and. Uh, there need to be more um, data warehouse availability, so like being able to collect data in a meaningful way. Um, and so it's kind of a both and because there is some investment in the hardware, but essentially it's a, a outsourcing that those, the same employees get paid now by Dynamic Campus. So the funds that were going into the employees not like on our payroll are now on their payroll. So, so it's a both and. So yes, there's an investment because we needed to make an investment to catch up to some of the older equipment. Um, and I'm not a technology person. I'd have to get Greg Amato in here to explain more of this. But essentially, we needed to make some upgrades in hardware and software that, that are costing extra because we needed to make that investment anyway. Um, can I answer yeah. a second part of that question? So some of the contracts that we have associated with just the technology needs across campus, copiers, phones, all of that, they have helped identify all of those. Are there some that overlap? Are there some that we no longer need? They can take, when they start building that data warehouse for all of our systems to communicate with each other, they will, when those contracts become uh, ready for another term, they will either A, determine do we really need those and if not, those will be canceled, which will be a savings to us. Or B, can we negotiate terms? Because maybe we only need A, B, and C components of that contract and not A through M, if that makes sense. So there, there will be some, sig savings. some significant contract okay. savings as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great question, though. Thank you. S Scott, um, <laughs> something that I know I, I first learned about in the fall, and I know many students have, have now begun to ask about it. Can you talk more about the conference campaign that Greenville is launching, yeah. um, and maybe why now um, that, that we're launching it, and maybe what are some of the things that we, if, if the com campaign goes well, what are we going to invest in moving right. forward? Um, so just uh, a comprehensive campaign, comprehensive means all inclusive. Um, there are several different types of campaigns that you can run. Um, we do an annual campaign, an annual scholarship campaign every year. Um, that's a part of this comprehensive campaign. There's also capital campaigns that you can do. We are raising money to build a building. There is a capital portion of this campaign. There are also endowment campaigns. Um, endowment campaigns, if you, don't, if you may not know what an endowment is, but an endowment is basically like a a savings account that you just, you never touch, you just use the interest of it. And so you let that get bigger and bigger and bigger and grow over time and then it's a constant, it's a permanent source of income for you um, as an institution. Most institutions across the country have those. Um, so this campaign is actually the most focused on endowments. Okay, it's on endowment and also scholarships. Um, and you can have endowed scholarships, um, but that is, most of the money that is raised is going to go towards scholarship because that's that's what we need. Um, just as Barb was talking about the eleven million dollars that was given just last year, um, only about 
two million dollars of that is philanthropically backed, and we have to close that gap. Um, so, I mean, ideally, um, every scholarship that we give, give out would be philanthropically backed by some donor and some actual dollar that's out there, if you will. Um, we're, we're far away from that. So we want to try to close that gap. Um, that would be very good for students. Um, it makes scholarships more permanent, it makes the scholarships more available, and it's, it's going to help us reduce the tuition in the long term. Um, and so we're doing that for multiple ways. So endowed scholarships, so that's again, large sums of money, like a million dollars, we set aside and we use $50,000 of it every year forever. And that million dollars stays there. That's how it works. Um, so instead of spending that million dollars in a couple of years and it's gone, we want to keep it forever. So the comprehensive campaign is that. Um, why now? Um, we, this last spring, uh, when we, when we, wanted to try to improve our situation and how look towards the future. We pursued this, what we call a pivot strategy, and it's a three-legged three stool. Um, one of them was trying to reduce costs immediately, as fast as we could strategically. Um, another was investing in enrollment, which has already paid, started to pay some dividends. We've seen some increases there. And then that third leg of the stool was the comprehensive campaign to invest in fundraising. Um, so that we can raise more money. Um, and so that's, um, we felt like the timing was good. We did a study. Um, it, was, it was a study that we were actually already doing, so it was separate of that process, but when it came back, it came back positive. Um, we've done three studies like this over the past 10 years. Um, the first two came back negative. They said, don't do a campaign for these reasons. There's multiple reasons. This one came back and said, pursue a campaign, your donors are ready. And so we listened to that, um, our board listened to that, and they said, okay, well, even though it sounds, it's it's a little bit counterintuitive to be like, hey, during this difficult time, we're gonna, we're gonna push through, but actually, it, it isn't. It's, it's part of the grit and the persistence that we claim, um, is that when the going gets tough, tough gets going, it sounds cliche. Um, <laughs> but that's exactly what we're trying to do with the comprehensive campaign, is, is to double down try to engage our donors more um, and our alumni. Um, you know, I will say, yeah, you know, this is a little off, but uh, you know, it's awesome to see each and every one of you in this room. Thank you for being here. Um, it shows your commitment to this institution. That gives me great hope for when you leave here and the ex experience that you're gonna finish with. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, in, in 20 years from now, um, this place will be a different place, but it'll be very much the same. Um, and, and you will be hearing from us. Some of you in this room will do extremely well. You'll all do very well. But some of you will do extremely well and do well financially. And, and instead of um, spending that money all on yourself, which you can do if you wanted to, if you could give back to the students that are at the college now, or in the future, um, that's going to help. And so, and, and the campaign helps us do that. It's a it's a it's an organized effort to be able to to build that momentum. I mean, it takes that in order to get um, donors to to invest in an institution. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to make a quick note. So I'm looking at the time. I'm going to ask two more questions. And then I'm going to open up for the open forum questions. So if you have not, like, you know, pass them along to Anna and Kinsey here and give me like a five minute warning to do so. And then we're going to get going. Um, so, Suzanne, uh, last question for you on, the, on this one. Uh, all the changes we've been talking about this evening, how are these changes and these reductions going to benefit these students now? Um, and can you maybe give some examples of? Clearly, like clearly, how is this going to help them? Yeah, I, um, so a couple things there. Um, one is I, I hope, and I think this was covered maybe Monday night, that uh, the programs that are phasing out, they're still available to every student who has declared those majors. So, it, so I do want to be clear that we are paying careful <laughs> attention to make sure that all of you are able to complete 
according to the major that you uh, had declared coming in and I have declared as a student. So that's, that's one thing I want to make sure we're aware of. Um, I think that uh, through all of this, as Barb was saying, we want to make sure our resources are aligned as much as possible to give a quality experience to all of you. So, you know, there, there are some majors that don't get close to that 20 to 1 ratio. They have, they have very large classes. And we do need to be able to invest and, and maybe split up some sections and, and be able to have a more quality experience in some areas. Um, for example, we have a lot, very specifically, we have a lot of sports management majors and, and we're trying to figure out um, through the dean there, you know, how do we, how do we make things a great experience and, and uh, maybe break up, I you know intro to business got very large and so we we're trying to make sure that, that uh, Professor Bell could teach that uh, separately instead of just having more and more students in that <coughs> class we, we offered more sections of it for example um, and so she could teach smaller groups than just one huge group I mean it's still really big though those are just two examples um, I know that we have some of those issues in uh, biology as well and it gets especially complicated when there's lab classes and and things like that that you have to get in and you can only get a certain number of students in it so um, I think that that's one way I, I do think the uh, BPA Brian Hartley is really thinking through um, how do we continue even if we don't have a certain department uh, how can we still offer really quality experience in um, our choir and, and the things that we do with music. How can we uh, make sure that everyone has really great core liberal art classes and maybe in different uh, ways, more innovative ways. So, so I think there's going to be some really uh, great uh, quality initiatives uh, in the academic programs as well as the institution uh, overall. Great, thank you. So our final question, and I laughed when, when this was submitted, not at the student, I just think it's a funny question. So Barb, this one's for you. Uh, as a student, how can I get rich? <laughs> I have an answer for you. That's good. Oh, no, no. I'm not rich, so it's not like oh. I can tell you from example. But I would say, first of all, finish your degree <laughs> at Greenville yes. University. For sure. Number one priority. <clears throat> Number two, Develop a budget, live within your means. If you don't know how to do a budget, I am very happy and willing to meet with you to come up with a budget. It's what I absolutely love to do in life. I have walked alongside many families in my church community and outside my church community to help get them on a budget. They're working the plan, work the plan. Begin investing early. So invest your dollars now. Don't think, oh, I'm only 20 years old and I'm not retiring for 45 more years. You have no idea by putting $25 a month aside from now and 20, the next 25 years how much that can grow exponentially. So it can help fund your retirement and you might be able to retire at 55, not 65 or 67, whatever the age is. Um, and then give. <coughs> One of my favorite things, I uh, facilitated Financial Peace University classes in our church and our community, and one of, the, one of the lessons that I loved most was on giving. And I would tell you to give back to GU because many of you in this room, if not all of you, have received a scholarship from some blessed donor to help fund your education, and this is one way you can give back you can establish a scholarship and you can work with Scott or one of his staff members to make that happen. But what, one of the things that Dave showed on the video was when you give, you give with open hands and God blesses with open hands and you will receive back with open hands, whether that's a monetary <coughs> blessing whether that's a spiritual blessing, whatever that looks like. But if you don't give because of this, because of closed fists, you will not get either. 
you will not get those monetary blessings, nor will you get the spiritual blessing, because you approach God and life with a closed fist. But if you live your life with open hands, whether you're giving of your time, yourself, your talents, your money, whatever that looks like, go from here and give with open hands, and you will become rich. You may not be rich monetarily or rich as the world determines that, but you will be rich spiritually. So that's how you can get rich. Awesome. Okay, let's take a couple minute break. I'm going to get the questions and then we'll come right back. So phones, water, bathroom, and we'll keep going. Anybody have any more questions? It may have backfired just a little bit. Uh, as I was going through the questions, looking with them, some of these questions were either asked on Monday night, and so maybe some of you weren't there, and so you missed out on hearing that answer, or you know the people who are up here can't answer these que questions as directly as they are because you know they're more focused on it. So I think I just want to like apologize. I think um, <coughs> you know maybe having some of these questions available on Monday evening could have been more beneficial. So I'm going to do my best to answer them, and then I'm going to ask some questions that we did find that, that this group would have answered. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Um, so let me go through. Uh, one of them was. Uh, how do we plan on accommodating transfer students, current or incoming? Uh, because it seems like we've been focusing a lot on um, in, like new uh, freshmen, like uh, you know, new to college. Um, I would, I would, if you are you know, asking this question, or if you have you know friends like this, I would, I would push them towards the records office. I think they're going to be the best bet for you right now, or if you're asking you know on behalf of a friend, um, because they know that the academic catalog the best. Does that make sense? So um, I think there's a lot of, I think there still is Memphis information out there of, of kind of what's going on. And so I would, I would push them towards the records <coughs> office because those are just very like, um, like ground level type, type, type questions. Oh yeah, this is a good question. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the group, and we'll see who, who wants to take it. On Monday, it was stated that the budget needed to be fixed right now. Why did the board wait till mid-spring to like start addressing this? Why did we begin to address this earlier? You want me to take it? Sure. So, um, <coughs> why did we why did we wait till this spring? Is that the yeah, um, I think that. Um, there was a series of events that happened um, over the course of late last fall and the early part of this year um, where we really discovered the situation that we were in for various reasons. Um, and so it took us by surprise. Um, and uh, we immediate, immediately addressed it with our leadership. Um, but we kept on covering more and more things as we went along, especially these two wonderful people um, and and so we were trying to figure out exactly where we were it was a very tough time I mean if you've ever figured out like there's if you find something's wrong and you start peeling it back and you're like there's more wrong here than we ever thought and how far does this thing go um, we wanted to basically peel the whole thing off <laughs> to figure out exactly what we were, where we were and try to create a plan based on that instead of saying okay Here's the problem. Let's fix it. And then, oh, here's another problem. Let's fix that. Okay, you know. So we didn't want to play whack-a-mole. We wanted to try to be a little bit more strategic. Um, and so, it did took us by surprise. Um, and it took us a couple months to figure out exactly what we're going to do. And then we started to implement that plan over the summer. And that's where we were, where we are right now. Um, so it's it has been uh, it's been a whirlwind uh, for everyone involved. I think everybody has done a, a the best that they possibly can do. Um, uh, I will say, uh, I think on Monday we went more in depth in that process of, and, and more specific timeline. So if you have fault questions about that, I know the, I think it was Papyrus video was posted Monday evening or Tuesday morning. So I would check that out if you want a more specific like timeline there with what happened. Uh, another question that was sort of asked on Monday, but I think it's a good follow up. Uh, if there are still minors being offered for the cut majors, who are going to teach them? Um, are we going to hire adjuncts? Uh, will you have to hire someone new? Yeah, so I, I mean, 
there's a lot of details that are um, being worked out with the deans and the department heads to try to make sure that there's the most options available and if there's a minor making sure they're supported I know a lot of our faculty are credentialed in multiple areas and so it might be that one full-time faculty member could cover um, another area that would be in a minor or in a gen ed class or whatever the case might be um, of course there, there are uh, pretty deep adjunct networks in certain areas that we have access to um, that's not the answer to everything by any means but it is an answer where there's um, you know there's some really qualified people and get some different voices um, in the classroom so that the, the student experience can kind of be diversified with various professors so they don't have one professor all the time um, so there's lots of details still being worked out as to how those resources will realign okay. there's one minute sorry I'm a bad timekeeper you just have one minute Okay, I'm going to rapid fire these three in the right here. Uh, what is our current endowment? Twenty million. And what is the plan? Like, what's what's the goal to increase it? Increase it by ten million. Okay. Did right hear that? Twenty increase it by ten. Uh, how do scholarships come out of our tuition? Sorry, I'm not I think earlier I heard twenty-five million dollars. We we raise in tuition and we give out. 11, 11.2, 11. 11. Yes. 11. okay, how does that process work? So financial aid looks at every single individual in your financial package, what, what your estimated family contribution is going to be, and then they <coughs> package that accordingly. But those scholarship dollars, if they're not funded by an endowment, which again, there's roughly a million dollars that was paid out in endowed scholarships last year, so where'd the other 10 million come from? Another million was raised by the advancement office through donor gifts so that's another million so now we're down to nine the institution funded that for you that came out of our operational budget as an expense line yeah. um, moving forward will will those types of scholarships be affected by these cuts no no no, no. no. we're not going to cut scholarships at all no, no. okay uh, Okay, last one, I th and I think this is I think it's a good one. Um, could could different marketing strategies have influenced maybe like students in the majors that they choose? Um, and was there more of an effort to you know market some majors over over other ones with you know current marketing strategies? No, we don't really try to get students into one major or another as long as we have a program of interest based on what they're telling us on the application, um, then we just make sure that they understand the nature of all the programs that we have, and is this the one that they really want to, to do. Um, I suppose that, you know, in some regards, you could always, you know, market something really, really hard to try to, you know, if you really think you're a market leader in a certain program and you've put a lot of resources into it, <laughs> I suppose you could do more, but, Generally, we don't take as much of a programmatic approach to marketing. It's a little bit more broad-based of what's the value proposition for the institution and why they want to come here. And then we give a list of majors that are offered, and then students just freely select um, based on their interests. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we'll go. We'll go. Last one with this one. Um, and Barbara, this might be a question for you. Earlier, you mentioned like where where does if you could break down maybe some big areas, where does tuition dollars actually go? When students pay to come here, obviously we've talked about scholarships, we've talked about salaries and benefits for the employees, we've talked about you know support services. Are there other areas that you didn't address earlier? Uh, or are those the big course, three? Of course, you have your property management. You know, so there's custodial services. You know, because you need someone to clean your classrooms and that kind of stuff. You know, there's air, lights, heat. Fresh sure, ideas. We'll have heat, fresh ideas, food services. Um, I mean, those are some of the bigger ones. But mostly faculty. And, but again, let's go back to the, you know, the salaries for people, you know, in programming. Um, again, that's like 96% just in salaries. Okay, thank you. Well, I want to echo what Scott said earlier. I was, um, 
you know, really appreciative of, of students showing up Monday evening, and I want to say it again this, again this evening. Um, it just shows your commitment to um, not only holding, I think, administration accountable for decisions that they've made, you know, but also showing that you are committed to, to the institution. So thank you again for, for coming this evening. Uh, can we give a round of applause for our panel? For, for um, as, as far as I know, maybe I'll let Denara, you know, or she's pointing, I'll let someone else. I don't know a specific what's next for, for students and how they can continue to engage, but more information to come. Is that fair to say? Good. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so the survey that uh, Cindy Webster, the president, sent out, um, that's still live. So if you have questions, keep asking, and um, we will do our best to connect you with people that can provide answers to those questions. Um, and once again, shameless plug, come to Senate Wednesdays, 9.30, right over there. Awesome. Thank you all so much this evening. That's it. Thank you.